Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at the last section of Jude, verses 17 to 24. Our previous two weeks have covered false teachers and also the sin of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. It is at this point in the letter where Jude shifts gears and calls the church to persevere. Let's turn to Jude 17 to 24 together now. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers walking according to their ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are unbelievers, not having the Spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Now, undoubtedly, as we read, you too see a shift in tone from the first portion of Jude to the last. I think this is because Jude wanted to write a letter of encouragement, but false teaching had to be addressed. Now that that topic is covered, however, in his letter, Jude starts to encourage the church and point to them towards the hope that they have in Christ. Within this passage, there are four primary points that we can take away. The first one is that there will be division. Second, we must keep ourselves in love. Third, we must show mercy, snatching others from the fire. And fourth, our strength comes from Christ and our hope is secure. These four points that Jude makes all gather together to create a hearty encouragement to an otherwise difficult letter. He ends off in this manner because he knows that despite there being uh, an existing presence of false teaching, we must continually remember that we are in Christ and what our goal and mission as Christian disciples should be. Now, firstly, there will be division. If we read from Jude 17 to 19, we see that Jude states, but you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are unbelievers, not having the Spirit. Now, being Christians, we will always have some sort of division or difference from the rest of the world. For those who live by the Spirit will live much differently than those who live according to the flesh. For those outside of our churches, the more we cling to the cross and follow the word of the Lord, the more we will see them jeer and persecute us. Paul writes in, in uh, 2 Timothy, verses 3 to 10. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that, I came, that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, 
All those who want to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, we will meet those who scoff at religion, but I think the church does not always help itself in this regard either. I find that all too often, fellow Christians scoff at contempt in each other's theology or how they run each other's churches. There are certain things we must hold with a closed fist and things that we never let go of, such as the deity and all sufficiency of Christ for our salvation. But there are dogmas that differ from church to church and are not things that are dependent on salvation. Sadly, I have known plenty of scoffing to take place over theologically nitpicky issues that divide rather than unite the body of Christ. We will not concede the primary tenets of our faith. Still, we must be careful not to split the church over tetrary issues such as the taste in music or the color of the church pews. Or, and, and you may wonder at this, but these issues are things of which churches have split over. And in the whole spectrum of eternity, they matter very little compared to the importance and the unity of the church. This brings us to our next point. Keep yourself in love. For love is the antidote to scoffing and a contemptuous spirit that has the tendency to build if we are in our own head for too long. The best way to keep unity in the body of Christ is to do precisely what Jude mentions next. He says, but you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. The solution to disunity is to focus on a person, on your own personal relationship with God. Paul reveals in Colossians that prayer is a vital component in maintaining gracious speech toward one another. He says, Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert and in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Act wisely towards others, making the most of time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Now, not only does prayer allow us to speak words of salt and life, but it keeps us in the love of God. For out of, it is out of a clean heart and one that is right before God that good speech and good acts will pour out. We can read an example of this in Colossians 1, 9 to 14, where Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with all knowledge of his of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints inheritance, the inheritance of the light, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, 
we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. It is this type of attitude that is the result of a prayerful and vibrant faith in the Lord. This is the attitude that Jude calls all believers to have, despite the waging of spiritual warfare all around us. Sometimes, when we as Christians fight for the truth, we fight and we fight and we fight, but we become hardened and weary. But it is important that we don't become jaded. The Lord desires that we maintain a soft and loving heart toward all. This is, this is so that all Christians who are living for the Lord will feel loved within the church, so that non-believers will look, look at the church and be able to instantly recognize us by our love, and so that the prodigal would long to return and repent simply by seeing the faith, peace, and security that is lived out by a vibrant faith of those who are in Christian community. This brings us to our third point. Have mercy and save others. The love that we have for our God and each other must be expressed to those who are outside the church. Starting in verse 22, we read, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating the garment even defiled by the flesh. Jude, until this section, has been very much telling the church what they shouldn't do. He has called false teachers, or he has called out the false teachers from among the believers' midst. And he's brought up the sin of Cain, the heir of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. But now he switches gears and tells the church what they ought to do moving forward from this point. He communicates that we as Christians must have mercy on those who doubt and save those by snatching them out of the fire. I think Jude brings up this point because, again, the effect of which we can have when we are continually battling for the truth. When people reject the truth and reject Christ around us again and again and again, it can be difficult not to grow a thick skin. Christianity and its beliefs are often seen as archaic and backward. The media attacks us when we stand upon the truth of God's word. And in many jobs, a Christian is at risk of losing their job if they even talk about their faith, especially if you work in any government position. This often leads us to develop an us-versus-them mentality which hampers the spread of the gospel. Now, it is absolutely true. We should defend our rights to practice our religion openly, but we must do so in a manner that still mercifully communicates the gospel. We must be careful not to build hate in our hearts towards those that persecute and mock the church. Paul writes, Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. It is our duty as disciples of Christ to bring the gospel to the world, no matter who they are, or what they have done. Nobody is too far gone or lost, and there must always in our hearts be an, a door that is open and that is willing to tell even the most obstinate sinner about the wonderful grace of Christ. They may reject time and time again, but one day they may listen. And if they do, they are snatched out of the fire and are given new life in Christ, to which we know angels celebrate in heaven over. Jesus states in Matthew 43 to 48, Love 
or you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this question leaves us something in our minds. Be perfect? Well, how do we do that? The answer is that we can't. And this is our fourth point. We must rely on the strength that comes only from Christ. We cannot in our humanness act or react in a godly manner to false teachers, to the ungodly, or to our persecutors if we do not first find our strength and our foundation in Christ. Paul labored through many persecutions, yet he wrote that the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he concluded this statement with, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness with insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we rely on Christ for our strength and trust in his plans and purposes fully, we can endure all types of persecutions and hardship. For his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. This is how we too can share the same strength of faith as those who were examples of faith in the book of Hebrews. If we turn to Hebrews 11, we see these examples Women received their dead. They were raised to life again. Some men were tortured, not accepting release, so that they might gain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and on the mountains, hiding in the caves and the holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Now, we must know that when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may endure trial and persecution. And we must know that the love of Christ cannot be separated far from us. For we read in, we read in Romans 8, verses 36 to 39, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or the danger or the sword As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long, and we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor hostile powers, nor height, or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when we, were, and when we are in the love of Christ, 
we can be assured of our eternal hope, which Jesus prays about in John 17. John 17 is a prayer that Jesus prayed before he was going to be crucified. And it echoes in our hearts to this day. For we can be assured that he is sitting in the throne room at the right hand of God, advocating on our behalf. I want to read the first 18 verses of this prayer and then turn to Revelation before concluding. This is John 17. Jesus spoke these things looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to all that you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that all things you have given to me are from you, because the words that you gave me, I have given them. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those that you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is is mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name that you have been given that, that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name, and that you had given me. I guarded them, and not one of them is lost, except for the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them, because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified in the truth. We see from the Gospels and the stories in the Bible that we know so well that Christ conquered death so that we may inherit eternal life. And we can have full assurance knowing that God will have the ultimate victory over sin and death. Our hope is mentioned and found in Revelation 21 verses 3 to 4 where we read, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. Here we see that we have a hope in dwelling eternally with our Lord. It is ultimately the strength that we have in Him and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that gives gives us full assurance of our salvation and which equips us to live in a manner which we can have mercy on others so that we would be good disciples and bring the gospel to all people. 
We have hope in a time where we can eternally sing alongside of the angels and bask, in the pre- and bask with the multitude of saints in the glory of God. So as we put down this book of Jude and having reached the end of its 25 verses, we are given an image of the power of Christ and the knowledge of of where our strength comes from. We can persevere no matter what this world throws at us because we have that eternal hope. Let's close in prayer. May God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, enable us to speak and live the gospel to the whole world around us so that they would know the light and the truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, so stir our hearts so that they will not be hardened by the scoffing and the persecution that this world heaps upon all Christians. Lord, give us your grace so that we may take part in the snatching of those out of the fire that are in rebellion to you. We long that they too would join us in the eternal hope and the inheritance that has been given to every believer in Christ. And that they too would have the pleasure and the honor of knowing you as the God who saves and the Lord who redeems. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.